Hello, my name is Stefan Schwarzer. Welcome to this lesson about soil life. Soil life is really at the centerpiece of the Regag movement. It is recognized as being the key driver for soil vitality, soil health and the growth and health of the plants. In this lesson, you will learn about the complexity of soil life as a prerequisite for soil and plant health, about the benefits that the plant derives from interaction with bacteria and fungi, and the process of nutrient exchange between plants and bacteria. Although mostly hidden to our eyes, this realm is really fascinating and incredibly rich and diverse, as portrayed by this tiny thing which you can see on the photo. The so-called water beers have been found everywhere in Earth's biosphere, from mountain tops to the deep sea and mud volcanoes, and from tropical rainforest to the Antarctic. Tardigrades, the scientific term, are among the most known resilient animals with individual species able to survive extreme conditions such as exposure to extreme temperatures, extreme pressures, air deprivation, radiation, dehydration and starvation that would quickly kill most other known forms of life. And yes, they can be found in our soils too. In a teaspoon of healthy soil we can find more microorganisms, mainly bacteria and fungi and much of other microscopic life invisible to our naked eye than there are people on our planet. Indeed, in a single gram of healthy soil there are millions of different species of bacteria and thousands of species of fungi to be found, which influence nutrient and water storage in the soil as well as the plant's growth and health. An American soil scientist said recently in a presentation to farmers, it's the biology stupid, an analogy to the Bill Clinton's campaign slogan with which he won the 1992 US presidential election. And yes, indeed, soil is at its base defined as a mixture of organic and mineral substances. So without biology, there is no soil. It's actually the biology which holds the soil, the minerals, together. It's those many and tiny creatures who, through their living, pooping and dying, glue the mineral particles together and form stable aggregates. These photos show a tiny bit of the incredible, miraculous, diverse and hidden life beneath our feet. Actually, there's a saying that 98% of life on Earth has not yet been discovered because it lays under our feet, so small that we don't see it without strong microscopes. But it's, it's exactly this life which indirectly feed us through the plants. So let's dig deeper into this fascinating world. The above ground biomass can feed in our latitude and on one hectare a large cow or an ox. In contrast to this, the below ground realm sustains on a field of the same size some 5 to 10 tons of life, which could be represented by these additional cows. This so-called edifon is composed mainly of fungi and bacteria, when they are still alive and the fields have not been impoverished through the use of different pesticides. If we look into the forest, the case is even more fascinating, as here we can count some 25 tons of soil life on a single hectare. 60% of soil life is composed of fungi, 30% of bacteria, and only 10% of partially larger life forms, some of which, as for example nematodes or bugs and spiders, are visible to our eyes. Well, Nature hasn't developed that incredible diversity and quantity of life for nothing. There is more to it, as we can see in the next slides. If we dig out the soil beneath the feed imprint in a healthy forest to depth of 20 or 25 centimeters, we can discover in the small quantity of soil 500 kilometers of hyphae the long branching filamentous structure of a fungus. Hyphae are the main mode of vegetative growth 
and are collectively called a mycelium. What we recognize generally as mushrooms are only the fruiting parts of the hidden body, comparable to the apples we can see on a tree, while the tree would be hidden in the soil. Some fungi live on decaying matter, but many actually form a symbiosis, a mutual beneficial relationship with plants. These are called mycorrhiza, a combination of the Greek word for fungus and root. The mycorrhiza can be considered as somewhat of an extension of the plant's root system. Actually, that symbiosis is 415 million years old. When plants moved from the ocean onto the land, the fungi had already conquered the bland, rocky land surface to retrieve minerals from there. Plants developed the root system to hold themselves to the ground, but started that cooperation with the fungi from the beginning. So what happens here is a bargain or bazaar where one thing is exchanged for another thing. In this case, it is carbohydrates and starches for minerals and water. That is, only plants can gener generate through photosynthesis carbohydrates from fresh air. Some 20 to 60 percent of these sugars or more complex products the plant is producing is pushed by the plants down into the roots and as so-called root exudate into the rhizosphere. This is a feast for bacteria and fungi, but nothing is for free. So bacteria and fungi provide the plants in exchange with minerals and water. Actually, 92% of all known plants do form such a relationship with the fungi. Those 8% of the plants without the willingness to cooperate with fungi are mostly pioneer plants which have evolved to conquer terrain which has not yet developed to be rich in soil life. The ultra-fine hyphae can penetrate much better than the relatively thick roots into the finest cracks in soil aggregates and rocks and dissolve nutrients or retrieve water from there, extending the root surface by a factor of 10 to 100 and the total root biomass by up to 1,000 times. All those fine white hairs are part of the fungi, which lives in symbiosis with the plant, of which we see much thicker the roots. While the benefits for the fungi and bacteria are clearly the life-giving energy in form of carbohydrates, the plant profits directly and indirectly in many ways from the cooperation. Clearly, the supply of nutrients and water is key for the plants, but it receives not only pure minerals, but also amino acids and proteins produced by fungi and bacteria. This can increase the plant's pest resistance, as it can, for example, produce a thicker leaf protection, pr pr protection and incorporate insect repellent substances. The plant develops a greater stress tolerance as it is being provided with a steady flow of water and essential minerals. The plant comes with a greater nutrient density as that cooperation assures that ongoing flow of nutrients. The fungi, when they grow, develop a kind of glue called glomalin, which helps the fungi to bridge air-filled spaces in the aggregates. This glue really glues the soil particles together, stabilizing the soil. And that stuff, the glomalin, is composed to a high percentage of carbon, thus helping to store and sequester carbon in the soil. 80 to 90 percent of the nutrient uptake of the plant is mediated microbiologically. And there we don't speak only about the so-called essential nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus, but as for us humans as well, also about those many micronutrients like boron, zinc or manganese, which are important for healthy growth of the plant. Rudolf Steiner said once very wisely, it is not at all true that life ends with the contour, with the perimeter of the plant. Life as such continues 
especially from the roots of the plants into the soil. And for many plants, there is no sharp boundary between life within the plant and life in the area around the plant. These are photos which show the roots exudates. These drops are kind of energy drinks filled with sugars, starch, amino acids. The table is set, so to say, for bacteria and fungi in the soil, which depend on this life-maintaining ingredients. As bacteria and fungi poop and vomit, live and die, that biomass gets slowly incorporated into the soil. Scientists have found out that the root inputs are up to five times more likely than an equivalent mass of above ground litter to be stabilized as soil organic matter. So when we talk about soil fertility and carbon sequestration, we should talk about feeding fungi and bacteria and much less about leaving organic matter on the ground. Although this clearly helps protecting the soil and feed the worms. Here's another fascinating part of the underground world. We spoke a lot about fungi, but bacteria are actually equally important for the plant's health. And what happens here is really another miracle. It was only recently discovered that plants are able to, so to say, digest bacteria. As we can see in the left photo, the before mentioned root exudates, mostly happening close to the tip of the roots, attract massive amounts of bacteria. Some of them can, as shown in the picture, picture on the right, eventually enter into the roots. Here, the cell walls of the bacteria are being dissolved by using superoxide, which frees important nutrients now available for the plant, which, however, does not kill the bacteria. While the plant digests these nutrients, the safe space within the root enables the bacteria to propagate. All those brown spots in the roots, which we see here, are actually intracellular bacteria on the way from the root tip through the fine root hairs. At the end of these, the plant spits these bacteria out into the rhizosphere. Again, this shows the miraculous evolution and the beneficial relationship between soil life and the plant. While the plant profits from essential nutrients, the bacteria profit from a partially safe harbor, enabling them to repopulate. Is it possible to discover something more impressive? I don't know, but here's another thing. Plants inoculate their seeds with bacteria, which are supposed to help the seeds in the first days and weeks and along their entire life. How do they get from the roots into the seeds? We still don't know this, but the effect is clear. On the left side, we see the root of a seed, which was first disinfected rigorously. On the right side, the same type of seed has been inoculated with Pseudomondas fluorescence bacteria onto first disinfected seeds. What we see is quite astonishing, that the soil bacteria changes completely the growth of the fine hairs of the plant. We have talked now quite a bit about bacteria and fungi and their importance for the plants. If we look into the natural systems, we see that be between disturbed or not yet evolved soils, which could be after landslide or in a not productive environment, and the climax state of nature in many regions of the world, the forest, there is a gradient of bacteria to fungi ratio. The less developed the soil is, the more it is dominated by bacteria. The more developed the soil is, the more fungi are present. Our agricultural fields are mainly in the realm of annual weeds, disturbed landscapes and poorly developed soils. This is an issue because bacteria-dominated soils do push naturally certain seeds to germinate, because these have a specific function, mainly to cover the soil and as pioneers that they are to begin building up the soil. In order to work more efficiently with nature, 
we would need to push the ratio more to an equal balance of bacteria to fungi, which is represented here in the perennial weeds and grasses state. This more balanced ratio would reduce naturally the growing of certain weeds and enable the cultures to grow, to grow more stable and healthier. Thank you for watching this lesson.